So when you're taking a history, it's really important to ask a variety of different questions. I used to think that you could just ask, oh, have you had any water damage? Patients don't understand what that means. It could be that they have a flat roof and there's a problem with the flat roof and leaks. You have to ask about any potential leaks. In California, we don't have basements, we have slabs. And oftentimes there will be sprinkler systems that will hit the side of the house and go under the slab. And you can have a slab leak, you can have all sorts of problems um, that you wouldn't think of that can lead to a, con a consistent dampness state which leads to mold growth, and this is a problem. So take a good history. Think about where the potential problems are in the houses that um, your patients live in. Also, too, with that whole contiguous um, air idea, if somebody lives in an apartment, they might ha have a problem in their apartment. It could be in the apartment next to them or the apartment down the, down the hall because all that air and all those mold and mycotoxins can float through the air. <clears throat> mold causes a tremendous amount of clinical symptoms and it gets very confusing because these look like the list of symptoms for lots of other things. Fatigue, weakness, headaches. I find that people who develop worsening symptoms, so ask about worsening symptoms uh, when people have moved. Um, chemical sensitivity, electrical sensitivity is actually a big one. They will get tremendous amount of hormonal dysregulation. Dysautonomia in POTS is often associated with mold and mycotoxins, so please ask about that and check for that hypoxia, confusion, chronic pain, insomnia. One of my primary symptoms was actually insomnia. Um, and I think you'll see that in both your Lyme and your uh, mold patients. Celiac disease, weight gain. <clears throat> when people talk about um, abrupt weight gain, I will often think about mold. Chronic infections, poor wound healing, poor wound healing, et cetera. Hello, there we go. The unfortunate thing is that the vast majority of the literature out there does not support the fact that all of these various neurological symptoms, cognitive symptoms, even the fatigue, the muscle aches and pains, autoimmune conditions, those do not um, in the literature associate with mold. Uh, this was an article given to me by a lawyer, actually, who was trying to prove a case. And so really, the, the, primary, sim the primary symptoms that you're going to be able to argue, should you ever be called in a legal battle, is the allergic respiratory symptoms. So I just wanted to point that out, that it's very hard to prove that the fatigue and the cognitive symptoms that your patient may be experiencing is going to be able to be um, validated as a, as a ca caused by mold. <clears throat> so environmentally acquired illness due to biotoxins, formerly known as SIRS, was really expanded upon, delineated by Dr. Richie Shoemaker. And we have to tip our hat to him because he did a tremendous amount of work in this field. He originally determined that there was a problem with biotoxins when many of his sick and patients became sick due to dinoflagellates in the Chesapeake Bay and he would give them cholestyramine and they would get better. And then this uh, snowballed into understanding that mold and mycotoxins cause problems. This is considered to be a genomic, multi-system, multi-symptom illness, and people will be sick unless you do something. Uh, the idea is that there's a defective antigen presentation uh, dysregulated in the innate immune system that results in chronic inflammation. And we'll go through the specifics. If it will forward, there we go. There's a case definition. As I mentioned, you have to have um, a musty odor or obvious presence of visible mold or commercial testing that verifies that the mold is there. There's a genetic predisposition, which I'll go through, although I have to say I no longer test for this genetic predisposition because I find that most people are, have it. <laughs> and um, it's not gonna change what I do. 
There are abnormalities in a visual contrast test, and there are specific biomarkers that we'll go through. So what happens is there's a dysfunctional adaptive immunity, leads to an overactive inflammatory state, and you get multiple systems in the body that are dysregulated. People will manifest autoimmunity, hormonal imbalances, neurological disturbances, pain, and fatigue. <clears throat> there's a list of 37 different symptoms. The more symptoms you have, the more likely you are to have mold exposure. Here's some of the list for your perusal. There's the rest of the list. And then a couple years ago, Scott McMahon, who is a, a colleague of Dr. Shoemaker's, came up with something called the cluster analysis. And I found that this is helpful. You can um, print this out in for your patients and ask them to circle all the symptoms that they have. And what you find is that the more symptoms that they have in the clusters, the more likely they are to have mold exposure as a cause of their symptoms. So for example, if they have fatigue, you have them circle fatigue, weakness, et cetera. And then each line is a cluster. So if you have eight or more uh, lines where at least one thing is circled, then you know that they likely have mold exposure and you need to ask more questions about that. <clears throat> so there's the rest of the clusters. So you add them up and figure out if they might need more testing or investigation. Okay, come on. <clears throat> Dr. Shoemaker taught us that 24 for 25% of the population are mold susceptible based on their HLA haplotype, and 21% are Lyme susceptible. I've done hundreds of testing. Oh, okay. Uh oh. I've done hundreds of patient testing. I found that probably all but two had the HLA haplotypes of some sort. And so I just haven't found it to be useful, nor is it clinically relevant. People can have the dreaded gene and look clinically fine and vice versa. So unless you really, really want to know or your patients really want to know and they want to spend the $800 it costs to run the test, I don't bother doing it, but I want you to know about it. <clears throat> the idea that Shoemaker teaches is that you have to have a priming event. So you have these genetic susceptibilities. There has to be some sort of inflammatory process happening in order for the mold to cause a problem. So for example, if people have underlying Lyme disease, they move into a moldy building, they will get sick. If they didn't have the underlying Lyme disease triggering some inflammatory cascade, they're not going to get sick. Or say they're living in a super moldy house, but they're tolerating it well, and then they get bit by a tick. Now they've got an inflammation response from the tick bite, from the Lyme disease, and now they can no longer tolerate their moldy house, and they will circle the drain really, really quickly. That's the, the idea. What is the HLA-DR? So it's a major histocompatibility, class two cell surface receptor. It's involved in graft versus host, and there are extensive polymorphisms. These are the way that we present antigens to T cells. Um, I think that there is a handout of this. This is the Rosetta Stone that Shoemaker came up with about the HLA susceptibilities because the labs that you would run through LabCorp or Quest do not look like the designations that we talk about. So this is how you do the conversion. One of the things that's really important about these, oh, and I had, a, I had another picture. There is actually a website that you can go to and you can input the information from LabCorp or Quest to figure out what's the, what the HLA haplotype is. I think it's, if you Google uh, HLA calculator, you'll probably find it. <clears throat> um, one of the reasons that this is really important to talk about is that these biotoxins are teeny, teeny, tiny. They flow in and out of the cell membrane. And so we can't easily detect them in blood. They are secreted by the liver into the bile, and they get reabsorbed into the body unless we tag them in the immune system. But many of these people that we're dealing with, they can't tag them, and so we can't get rid of the biotoxins. And this leads to chronic inflammation. 
And mold are not the only organisms that produce biotoxins. So ciguatera, uh, Fisteria, perhaps Lyme, the brown recluse spider, Babesia may produce biotoxins.